In this video, we continue our discussion of energy for life or energy metabolism. Before continuing on with our discussion of cellular respiration, let's review what we learned in the first video. Humans need energy to do biological work, of which there are three types, mechanical work, transport work, and chemical work. The direct source of energy for doing biological work comes from the hydrolysis of ATP. We hydrolyze a high energy bond and the energy that's released can be captured to do biological work. Cells have limited stores of ATP and for that reason we need to continually replace the ATP that's used. The first law of thermodynamics tells us that energy can't be created, but it can be changed from one form to another form. And the energy to support most of the life on Earth ultimately comes from the sun. Plants have the ability through photosynthesis to convert solar energy of the sun into chemical energy of large complex biomolecules like the monosaccharide glucose. Besides having ATP in our cells, we also have a related compound known as phosphocreatine. Both phosphocreatine and ATP have high energy bonds, uh, and the two together are known as phosphagens. And so using phosphocreatine to replace ATP is known as the phosphagen system. And we simply hydrolyze the high energy bond in phosphocreatine to get the energy to put a phosphate onto ADP to give us more ATP. The diagram to the left shows an overview of cellular respiration or the complete breakdown of carbohydrate. We'll go into a little bit more detail in this video and the next one after that. Uh, you can see that in this diagram, cellular respiration of a carbohydrate is broken down into four different stages. The first stage is known as glycolysis, and in glycolysis, glucose is broken down to two molecules of pyruvate. There's a lot more that goes on in glycolysis, and we'll look at it in a bit more detail in a little bit. Glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. Every, on the next three stages of cellular respiration occur in the mitochondria, and so the pyruvate first has to be moved into the mitochondria. Once there, it's converted into acetylcoenzyme A. This process doesn't have a name, and so in this diagram, it's simply referred to as stage two. After converting the pyruvate to acetylcoenzyme A, the acetylcoenzyme A enters the third stage, or the Krebs cycle. Your book refers to it as the citric acid cycle, and some texts refer to it as the TCA cycle. For the most part, I use the term the Krebs cycle. And then we finish cellular respiration of a carbohydrate uh, in stage four, or electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation. These two parts almost always occur together, and so typically I will always say electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation to try to emphasize that process. And then again, as we've said, this occurs in the mitochondria, the cell's powerhouse, the mitochondria is referred to as the powerhouse because this is where the majority uh, of ATP is synthesized. Again, oxidation of glucose is an exergonic process, meaning that there's a release of energy. And the, the release of energy that occurs in cellular respiration uh, is used to drive the phosphorylation of ADP. And that's illustrated in this diagram. The larger dark blue wheel uh, is the oxidation of carbohydrate to CO2 and water, and some of the energy is used to drive the endergonic reaction of phosphorylating ADP to ATP. And then, as we've said, uh, ATP can now be hydrolyzed to give us the energy to drive biological work. So uh, this dark blue wheel turning clockwise drives biological work counterclockwise, and this could be mechanical work, chemical work, and finally, transport work. Before moving on with the details of 
glycolysis, so let's look at how glucose gets to the inside of a cell. And so you know that uh, you get glucose in the foods that you eat. For the most part, you eat complex molecules, which are then broken down to glucose. The glucose moves across into the interstitial fluid, and then through a process of facilitated diffusion, the glucose crosses the cell membrane and gets to the inside of the cell. Uh, facilitated diffusion means that there has to be an integral protein that's used for the glucose to cross the membrane. And here you can see a GLUT molecule or a glucose transporter. I'd also like you to notice that as soon as glucose enters the cell, it has a phosphate stuck on it. It becomes glucose 6-phosphate. And this does two things. One thing is it traps the glucose molecule inside the cell because the glucose 6-phosphate cannot cross the cell membrane. The second thing it does is it keeps the concentration of glucose inside the cell low so that facilitated diffusion can continue to occur. This is also a diagram from your book, and it also shows you some of what we've just talked about. So glucose moves across the cell membrane via facilitated diffusion, and once inside the cell, it's phosphorylated to become glucose 6-phosphate. This is an example of chemical work and it uses energy from the hydrolysis of ATP. Now, what happens to the glucose 6-phosphate really depends upon what your situation is at the particular time. Uh, if you're resting and your energy need is fairly low, the glucose is going to be stored, and it gets stored as glycogen. So the first thing that happens is the phosphate gets moved from the 6-carbon to the 1-carbon, and then the glucose gets attached to the glycogen. This is a process which is referred to as glycogenesis, genesis or creation or production of. At some point later on, when you need the energy from that glucose molecule, you'll break down the glycogen in a process of glycogenolysis, and then the glucose 1-phosphate can be converted to glucose 6-phosphate, and it can continue on through glycolysis. On the other hand, in some cells of the body, not just the liver cell, but primarily the liver cell, you can remove the phosphate from the glucose and then let the glucose diffuse back out into the blood to try to help you come from becoming hypoglycemic. And here you can see another depiction of both glycogenesis and glycogenolysis. And here you can see that not only the liver cells, but cells in the kidney and also the epithelial cells of the GI tract have the ability to take the phosphate off of glucose 6-phosphate so that it can then move back out into the bloodstream. All right, and so now we come to glycolysis. And here you can see we have our glucose molecule, our C6H12O6. These six circles that you see here represent the six carbons in the glucose molecule. And as we've said several times now, glucose moves across the cell membrane via facilitated diffusion, and it is immediately phosphorylated. Putting a phosphate onto glucose and making glucose 6-phosphate is an example of chemical work. We need to put energy in, and so we hydrolyze ATP in order to get that energy. The glucose 6-phosphate is converted to fructose 6-phosphate. Fructose is just simply another monosaccharide. And then the fructose 6-phosphate is phosphorylated, again, giving us fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. That, too, is an example of chemical work, and so we hydrolyze ATP to uh, get fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. The reason why we do this is what we're doing is we're bumping up the energy level of the glucose molecule so that the energy in fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is higher than the energy in the glucose. And again, we've used 2-ATP to do this. What we do next is we take the molecule and we chop it in half. And so we went from a 6-carbon molecule with two phosphates on it to a 3-carbon molecule with one phosphate and a 3-carbon molecule with one phosphate. <clears throat> Then from here on, everything that happens to one of the three carbon molecules happens to the other, and so we refer to this as the common pathway. And you can see that one of the very first things that happens is we go through a redox reaction using NAD. NAD is that coenzyme which is so important to energy metabolism, and you can see that in this reaction it has picked up two electrons and become NADH.
that NADH can then go to electron transport and give us even more energy. So we get two NADHs. We continue through some other reactions that we're not going to worry about right now, and we phosphorylate an ADP to give us ATP. We do that for both of the two three-carbon pieces. So at this particular point, we're now at a net gain of zero ATP. We used two ATP, we got two ATP. So at this point, we're at net of zero. We go through a few more reactions, and again, we phosphorylate an ADP to ATP. We do it once, we do it twice, and so our net gain is two ATP, and you can see that we also end up with two pyruvate. So if we end up with two NADHs, two ATPs, and two pyruvate, we go through what I refer to as slow glycolysis. Now your textbooks, your textbook and other books will refer to this as aerobic glycolysis, which is a term that I don't like. If you look very, very carefully at glycolysis, you'll see that it's never aerobic. It's always indeed anaerobic. It is possible, however, to go one more step. Uh, there's a, an 11th reaction that we can go through, and the NADH gives its electrons back to the pyruvate, converting the pyruvate into lactate. This is what's referred to in your book as the lactic acid pathway, but I want you to notice that we went from pyruvate to lactate, not from pyruvic acid to lactic acid. There is a little bit of controversy regarding this. However, I don't believe that we produce pyruvic acid or lactic acid. I believe that we produce pyruvate and lactate. Now, if our end products are 2-NAD, 2-ATP, and 2-lactate, then we've gone through fast glycolysis. Your book and other books will refer to that as anaerobic glycolysis. But again, glycolysis is always anaerobic regardless of the end products that we end up with. This is a diagram from your book which is simply showing uh, the activation of glucose. So here we see glucose has energy in it, but we boost the energy by phosphorylating it and fructose 1,6-bisphosphate has a higher energy level than glucose does. We then go ahead and break down the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate in a series of steps, and we get 2-NADH, we get 2-ATP, and we get 2-pyruvate. Now, for those of you who are taking this class with me, what we just talked about for glycolysis is what I want you to know. You need to check with your professor if you're taking this on a different campus and see if she wants you to know more detail. Uh, and this diagram shows more detail. To start with, the double dotted line that you see is meant to represent the phospholipid bilayer of the cell, and here's our glute molecule. So the glucose moves across the cell membrane via facilitated diffusion, and we go through activation, where we end up with fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. This diagram is a little bit older and uses the older terminology and not the newer terminology. We then have to break that molecule in half so that we end up with two three-carbon pieces. Both are three-carbon pieces with a phosphate on them. And so we've gone through cleavage. And then finally, we go through the common pathway. And here you can see a little bit more detail in terms of the intermediates for each of the reactions that we go through. Now, your professor may want you to indeed memorize these things, but you can see what they are. The important thing here is that we get an NADH which will go to electron transport in most cases. Uh, and then we get our ATPs, and finally we get two pyruvates. And so this is showing you a detailed diagram of slow glycolysis. It doesn't go the 11th step and show you fast glycolysis.